some analysts call China's rejection of the recent ruling by the Permanent Court of Arbitration on matters of dispute in the South China Sea, China's first international test as an emerging power. Some media wonder whether a resurgent China will uphold the international order. Will fears of a China threat increase? Of immediate concern, what happens now? Are military tensions, escalations, even confrontations inevitable? How can China and the U.S. work together to cool down tensions? Underlying all these issues is what China calls its core interests. What are China's core interests? Do they include the dotted line, which defines China's claim of sovereignty in the South China Sea? Understanding all of China's interests bring us closer to China. For much of the last almost 40 years, China's foreign policy has been geared toward building relationships, joining global organizations such as the WTO, initiating the One Belt, One Road strategy, strengthening China-ASEAN relations, and forging partnerships with major world powers. This ancient civilization is engaging countries near and far, developing activities that are mutually beneficial for China and its partners. The term the Chinese government likes to use is win-win, to express and reinforce the notion that China's economic and political development will benefit its neighbors and, perhaps more importantly, China will not become a threat as its capabilities increase and its powers grow. Yet, on July 12th, China's foreign ministry and the Chinese media, as if with one voice, launched what could well be labeled an all-out information war against an award issued by the Permanent Court of Arbitration on disputes in the South China Sea. Wang Yi, China's foreign minister, called the award a political farce made under the pretext of law. Chinese people will not accept the result and all people around the world who uphold justice will not accept the result. China's non-acceptance and non-participation is to safeguard international rule of law and regional rules. Now the farce is over. It's time to get back to the right track. China has taken note of the signals from the Philippine government that is willing to resume discussion with China over the South China Sea issue. China's assertiveness rejecting the ruling was so strong that some observers were led to conclude that the Chinese government would rather be feared than be loved. Is this true? How are Chinese leaders thinking? What's their logic? What's their end game? To understand China's position and way of thinking, I spoke with General Peng Guangchen, a major general and military strategist. He's Deputy Secretary General of China's National Security Forum. And Shi Hong, Professor of International Relations and Director of the Center on American Studies at Renmin University. The claim of the tribunal is that this is not an issue of sovereignty because that's outside their jurisdiction, but it is ruling by specific elements of the UNCLOS uh, Convention. Uh, and in that, they say that one party, any party to a dispute, can bring an arbitration, which uh, enables it. You don't need both parties to do so. That's what the claim is. The Philippines and the Permanent Court of Arbitration played a trick, but not a wise one. They disguised the territorial entitlement of the disputed islands and reefs, as well as the maritime rights and interests, as an interpretation of the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea. In view of the current situation, the South China Sea issue is the first test for China on the path of the great rejuvenation of the nation, at least in this emerging period. We should deliver a satisfactory result, provided that we adhere to our principles and express our solemn position to the international community. Western analysts say that there has been ambiguity about whether South China Sea issues are indeed China's core interest. And up until 
2008, 2009, it seemed to be a, a fairly minor issue. It does not accord with the facts that China didn't attach importance to or show a tough attitude towards the South China Sea issue. Since the founding of the People's Republic of China in 1949, China has stressed China's territorial integrity and sovereignty, including our maritime rights and interests over the Nansha Islands, the Shisha Islands, the Zhongsha Islands and the Dongsha Islands. This is very clear, as Premier Zhou Enlai stated before. In the San Francisco conference following the Second World War, the participating countries signed a peace treaty. Though China joined the Second World War and defeated Japan, China was not invited to attend that conference. Even so, China reiterated and made a solemn statement that the integrity of Chinese territorial sovereignty is inalienable, including the maritime rights and interests of the whole South China Sea Islands. Later on, due to China's domestic situation, including the disruption of the Cultural Revolution, China had no time to attend to international politics and the construction of a Chinese navy. Since the 1970s, neighboring countries' plundering of China's Nansha Islands, as well as China's territorial waters, reached a climax. South China Sea disputes become a more heated issue after 2009. It was President Hu Jintao's administration back then. What becomes clear to all is that China will stand its ground on most issues concerning the South China Sea. The cost is to highly intensify Sino-U.S. relations or intensify relations between China and other Southeast Asian countries. It demonstrates that the Chinese government has regarded part of the interests of the South China Sea as China's core interests, which have therefore aggravated the disputes between China and related countries. When many foreigners first look at the Nine Dash Line, it looks very aggressive. It extends well more than a thousand kilometers from mainland uh, China. And it's within a few tens of kilometers from Vietnam or Malaysia or, or the Philippines. So just by its optics, it looks very aggressive. It is our territory, not because we are close to it. The territorial sovereignty is not divided depending on distance. Consider the case of Guam. It's closer to Asia. The United States is a part of the American continent. How do you become Asian countries? Take the Malvinas Island as another example. Malvinas is farther from Britain. It is closer to Argentina. Which country is farther from it? It's closer to Argentina, after all. Then why did the United Kingdom come there to fight a war? The United States has Navassa Island. It's more than a thousand kilometers away from the United States, but not more than 10 kilometers from Haiti. Why does the island belong to the United States? Besides, the British Channel Islands are less than 10 nautical miles from France. Then it should be part of France. And so how does it go to the United Kingdom? There's another example. Christmas Island of Australia, which we've mentioned just now, is 1,400 kilometers away from Australia. It's only 270 kilometers from Indonesia. Where are the French Saint-Pierre Islands on the other side of the Atlantic? They are closer to Canada. Their distance from Canada is probably less than 10 nautical miles. Thus, the ownership of islands is not identified by distance. Plenty of historical factors and other factors may affect it. China does not gain its sovereignty over the South China Sea Islands by stealing firstly, robbing secondly, cheating thirdly, or grabbing through wars for the fourth thing. We developed them, and we gained the fruits with blood and sweat by working diligently and conscientiously. How could it be possible for us to divide them by distance and give them to you because you're closer to them? I could also say the Philippines is close to China. So are the Philippines within Chinese territory or not? I'll tell you a little joke. They passed a law in the Philippines and Vietnam that their citizens are no longer allowed to go swimming. And when the citizens asked why, they said, well, if you go swimming, you will invade China. Let me tell you a truth. 
I'll begin with Vietnam. On September the 4th, 1956, China released a statement on the breadth of China's territorial sea, which included coastline, islands, and South China Sea islands. It was 12 nautical miles and caused no problem. Ten days later, on September the 14th, 1956, the then Prime Minister of Vietnam, Pham Van Dong, sent a formal note to our Prime Minister, Zhou Enlai. It was a diplomatic document which stated that Vietnam firmly agreed and supported China's statement, and it was of no problem that the South China Sea Islands were within China's territory. Second, let's turn to the Philippines. After the Spanish-American War in 1898, various treaties were signed, including the Washington Treaty, Paris Treaty, and some other treaties alike. All of these treaties and the Philippines' constitution indicate the sea area of the Philippines is bounded within East Longitude 118. Never did it say the area to the west of this boundary was its territory. From an international perspective, the International Civil Aviation Organization convened a meeting in 1955. The KMT government in Taiwan attended this conference since it represented China at that time and China had not joined the United Nations. It was required that China must set up a meteorological observation station in the South China Sea. Sixteen countries attended that conference, including the United States, Vietnam and the Philippines, and nobody disagreed. Why did the international community specify a Chinese representative then? It was because they believed that it was a place under China's jurisdiction, which was an international consensus. This is the first thing, and no one objected to it. The second event happened in 1987. A joint meeting held in the headquarters of UNESCO also assigned China to do that, and China had already joined the United Nations at that time. The Chinese government was going to establish the number 74 Ocean Observation Station, but these islands had been robbed by relevant countries so that China had no place to build the station. Then why did the international community and the headquarters of UNESCO specify China should build it? The reason was that within the international community, all of us agreed that it was a consensus, which does not need proof that this place was China's territory. With regard to territorial disputes in the South China Sea, the U.S. government has long maintained that it is neutral, while China, the Philippines, Vietnam, Malaysia, and Brunei are among the claimants. The U.S. Secretary of State reiterated this stance in January 2015. Let me emphasize again, the United States does not take sides on the sovereignty questions underlying the territorial disputes. We ask that all parties clarify their claims under international law, that they exercise restraint, and that they adhere to peaceful and diplomatic ways of addressing disagreements. As part of Washington's pivot to Asia, the U.S. has reinvigorated a security alliance with the Philippines and is helping modernize its navy. The U.S. is also rotating more ships to Singapore and Marines to Australia, as well as setting new defense guidelines with its ally Japan, which could participate in joint patrols in the South China Sea. Senior American officials have stated that the U.S. will strive to uphold the rule of law in the South China Sea. Moreover, this April, the U.S. urged ASEAN unity on recognizing the ruling. But the U.S. hasn't even ratified the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea on which the ruling was based. So how is China responding? The U.S. has pledged not take sides on the South China Sea issue. But its approach towards the issue has changed a great deal since the 1990s, from neutrality to limited interference, and now to active intervention by taking sides. In fact, the U.S. actions are causing the most trouble. After the ruling, China's Air Force confirmed that it will henceforth carry out regular air patrols in the South China Sea. So, on the one hand, the U.S. has been accusing China of militarizing the South China Sea, while on the other hand, China has been accusing the U.S. of repeatedly sending military vessels and aircraft 
on close-in surveillance missions, which the U.S. sees as wholly in accord with international law, but which China sees as acts of provocation. Washington hopes Beijing will honor its commitment to uphold international law. Beijing hopes Washington will honor its commitment of not taking sides on the South China Sea. What do you make of the initial response to the tribunal's award from the Philippines and from the U.S., the official response, not from the media? The reaction from the U.S. is to be expected. During the whole process of the arbitration, it looks just like a script whose director, writer and actors are all Americans, and the Philippines is just a stooge. Apparently, it's the Philippines who messed it up, but the fact is not so fundamental. Recently, a deputy minister of the Ministry of Education of the Philippines maintained that it was totally the conspiracy of the United States, and the U.S. was kidnapping and making use of the Philippines. These are their own words. Meanwhile, the General Secretary of the Maritime Center of the Philippines Ministry of Foreign Affairs, who had been in charge of territorial foreign maritime issues for a long time, held a similar attitude. It specified in the arbitral award submitted by the Philippines that they asked for a dialogue more than 50 times, but China refused all of them, so they argued for arbitration. However, this general secretary said they had never put forward a dialogue requirement, and he was in charge of these affairs, but he had never heard about it. Instead, it's China that required dialogue, but the Philippines chose to turn a blind eye to it. Originally, the South China Sea, I believe, is relatively calm. Although our islands have been occupied, we still hope to be able to sit down for negotiation. Then how about other countries? They are the ones who gain benefits by occupying our islands. Thus they have no reason to make further trouble, which will cause them to lose their vested interests. If the Philippines or United States negates China's rights in the region, no matter what, China should be prepared for war. However, even though the stance of China on the South China Sea issue has become very clear and resolute, the Chinese government, taking stability and peace in Southeast Asia and Northwest Pacific as its high priority, has not given a clear response to whether it will safeguard its core interests by force. You mentioned uh, U.S. Secretary of Defense uh, Ash Carter. Um, let me read to you what he, in fact, said. He said very recently, uh, now make no mistake, the United States will fly, sail, and operate wherever international law allows, as we do around the world, and the South China Sea is not and will not be an exception. The truth is that the free navigation plan of the United States began as early as 1979, before the launch of the United Nations Law of the Sea. This plan is in itself a kind of rebellion and boycott against the United Nations Law of the Sea. The US alleged that it is not subject to the United Nations Law of the Sea and it enjoys the freedom to travel in all the waters around the world, and this law cannot restrict it, and not a single law can restrict it. Thus, in 40 to 50 years since 1979, it has basically traveled around seven continents and four oceans and has essentially covered all the waters of the world. In recent years, it has traveled to a dozen countries every year. What does it mean? It suggests that the U.S. despises and does not respect international law and the United Nations law of the sea. Secondly, the U.S. alleged that it enjoys a unique maritime hegemony and that no one can stop it. That's unreasonable. Although the U.S. is a country of relatively rapid industrial development, strong economic power and military force, there is no reason for it to bully others. It should not do that. All the countries in the world, no matter how strong or weak, should be equal, and we cannot play power politics. In the past, that may have worked. However, it cannot do that nowadays. Bullying others is in violation of international law. In fact, it has been using its military forces to play the bully in all the waters around the world, including in the South China Sea, which is unwarrantable. Why is it bullying if you are operating in international waters, waters that the international community have, uh, uh, have stated clearly are international? 
Its action is not just conducted on the high seas. Its B-52 bombers have flown through our territorial sky, our territorial sky of 12 nautical miles. Its aircraft carrier has arrived within our jurisdiction, which means its aircraft carrier has entered our territory. The freedom of navigation we talk about is that of civil aviation, which features harmless passage and peaceful use. Its aircraft carrier and strategic bombers have run into airspace over our territorial sea to show its strength. It also alleged that it is not on the high seas, but in international waters and in international airspace, which it coined by itself. The United Nations Law of the Sea divides the territorial seas into territorial waters, high seas, exclusive economic zones, continental shelves and inland waters. There is no international water, it's not a concept of the United Nations Law of the Sea, and it is coined by America for the purpose of ignoring the sovereignty of other countries, which is kind of ignorance of the law, and that is terrible. I always wonder why no one ever seriously studied the regulation of the United Nations Law of the Sea in more than a hundred years of US history. If China is called upon to defend its sovereignty in the South China Sea, what kind of naval resources can the PLA bring to uh, the South China Sea? Taking a look at the sea power of the United States, it's far better than that of China in terms of the level and amount of equipment. The US has 10 carrier battle groups, which are nuclear powered. The capability of one US carrier battle group is equivalent to several of ours, and we only have one carrier battle group. In the future, we may establish two or three more of them, but it will depend on the development of the future. In terms of both the amount and scale, we are left far behind the United States. But I think our current naval power is enough for us to defend our territorial sea rights, and we're confident of that. The saying goes that the kind of battle we fight depends on what kind of weapons we have. We can definitely defend our country against foreign aggression with the existing weapons and equipment we have. China has one aircraft carrier in service, is building a second. How many aircraft carrier, aircraft carrier groups does China need to fulfill its naval objectives? Theoretically speaking, the country should have at least three aircraft carriers, one being repaired at home, one on duty at home, and one on patrol in our waters. Only in this way can we form a continuous fighting capacity. Senior Chinese officials have said that China would not militarize the South China Sea, but most analysts outside of China think China is doing exactly that with the construction of islands, with the bringing uh, airfields that can handle military aircraft, the uh, placing of anti-aircraft missiles, various other kinds of things. So is China indeed militarizing its uh, current islands in the South China Sea? That depends on the definition of the militarization. Militarization does not mean putting a weapon or a missile in the region. We are eligible to dispose of them on our own reef because we have the right to fully dominate the reef. We have constructed some civilian infrastructures, including some scientific research facilities, and we have established a lot of civilian infrastructures. We have also made efforts in the hydrological field, meteorological observation and maritime force development. We have also deployed some defense facilities at the same time, that's for sure, but that does not mean that we are promoting militarization in the region. The US also deployed military equipment in Guam and Hawaii, and I think their intensity far exceeds ours in the South China Sea. Is it fair to call our action militarization if theirs is not? The US has driven their aircraft carriers and strategic bombers into China. Isn't that militarization? They launched large-scale joint military exercises in China's waters in the South China Sea region. Isn't that militarization? They have done that around the South China Sea, including the military base in Singapore, and even in the Philippines Air Force base and naval base in recent days. Recently, the US even plans to do that in the Darwin base in Australia, and even in Vietnam. Isn't that militarization? The military bases the US established were used for military struggle. They have set the base of military land in our doorway. Isn't that militarization? 
Under such a circumstance, China has to have something to defend our home. Confronted with the pressure of so much military force and two aircraft carriers of the US, two of them already, should China react against it? If it should, is it reasonable? China at least has to have a stick to beat the barking dog or a kitchen knife. That's not militarization, that's called a necessary defensive ability. If the Chinese hold this for invasion, then it should be deemed militarization. China uses it to defend itself. I think that is fairly reasonable and they are necessary facilities. You have written eloquently on how the US and China can avoid the so-called Thucydides trap, where a rising power and a current power inevitably go to war. What were your primary points? What I want to stress is that Thucydides said in history that major powers will inevitably have a fight with one another. The result is either the defeat of A or that of B. And here I want to emphasize that China and the United States are two big powers now. One is a developing power and one is a developed power. That does not necessarily mean that these two countries will finish on the path of head-on collision. They can transcend the trap of collision repeated in human history. I have two theories. Firstly, China is a big country with 5,000 years of civilization. I don't think China is an emerging superpower because China is an ancient country with a 5,000-year civilization. It's more reasonable to regard the United States as an emerging country with its 240 years history compared with China. These two great powers definitely have different historical backgrounds, but that doesn't mean they will collide with each other. Why? Because in history, the rising country and the ruling power are often mutually contradictory or divided in interests, so they are conflicting in power. However, nowadays, the interests between China and the United States, as well as those between China and other countries, are becoming increasingly interdependent and mutually linked to each other. The second reason is that the development of military power today is not one achieved by the means of warfare and it has gone beyond the needs of an objective of war. The unlimited or unrestricted use of war will lead the belligerents to the opposite of what their objectives were. This will make the war act as a boomerang, which is likely to hurt oneself. In spite of the uneven power between China and the United States, we have the ability to destroy each other. The United States has the ability to destroy China a dozen times over. On the other hand, China has at least one chance to destroy the United States, even in self-defense. In the light of such an imbalance of power, no one, except lunatics, would wage such mutually fatal wars. So I don't think China and the United States will descend into conflicts under the current conditions of the new era. And my basic point is to go beyond this trap. President Xi Jinping reiterated that the purpose of China's foreign policy is safeguarding world peace and promoting common development with other countries. The tribunal case on the South China Sea seems to challenge that principle. Observers say that if China is forced to choose between protecting its national interests and projecting its national image, China, like every other major nation, would choose its national interests. But this disjunction between interest and image is obviously not absolute. Sometimes it's quite the contrary. Consider China's virtuous fight against aggression and oppression in World War II. Every nation upholds its own sovereignty rights. And it's a matter of judgment when interests and image cohere or conflict. President Xi also said, China will never give up our lawful rights. Chinese people do not make trouble but we are not cowards when involved in trouble. I'm told here that China's peaceful rise will not change. The conflict is temporary. As an ancient civilization, China says it has learned lessons from 5,000 years of history. To manage our world is to understand opposing views. That's why communications are vital. And that's Closer to China.